Today is Thursday, July 31st, 2008. My name is Mark DePue. I'm the Director of Oral History with the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library. I'm here with Chris Eckert today. Welcome, Chris. Thank you. Uh, and we're here to talk about uh, your experiences, Chris, in the family farm operation, but I think that's probably a misnomer of how you would want to describe the operation that you have. So how would you describe, what would you use as the, uh, the terms to describe that? It's a unique collection of different enterprises, but uh, farming is our core, and that's what we were bred from. And uh, but today we expand into retail, food service, and entertainment. Eckert Orchards, Eckert Incorporated, goes by both. There's actually three different companies. There's Eckert's Incorporated, Eckert Orchards Incorporated, and Eckert Land Company. So it's a uh, conglomeration of different entities that works together for different reasons. Okay. Well, we're going to take a big step back in, in time, though. Tell us when and where you were born. I was born in Belleville, uh, 1972, May 18th, and uh, grew up in the town of Millstadt, Illinois, which is about 15 miles west of here. And uh, your parents, your father? My dad is Larry Eckert, and that's spelled with one R. Uh, L-A-R-Y. Yep. And uh, my mom is Judy. Uh, her maiden name was Lannert. She grew up in the town of uh, Freeburg. My dad uh, grew up in this home. Uh, this was my grandma and grandpa's house. Now my wife and my family live here. Uh, and uh, they uh, met in grade school because he went to Freeburg grade school and then went to uh, Belleville High School. But uh, they uh, reunited their senior year in high school and then I guess the rest is history. Well, let's take a big step back in history, because I know that your fam you are the seventh generation on this, this operation, this piece of land. Uh, so let's start at the beginning, if you can. Okay. Um, my family immigrated to the United States from Germany, and uh, right outside of Frankfurt, Germany. The town was Dietzenbach, Germany, where they originated. And this is a, a kind of a German community in that time frame there were a lot of Germans coming uh, to this area. The soil and the climate is similar to that part of Germany and they were all farmers. They came here and found it kind of familiar and knew how to work the soil and be successful. So uh, that was in what year? 1837 uh, Johann Eckert immigrated from Germany and settled in a, a piece of property outside of the town of St. Labori, Illinois, which is about 15 miles east of here. That town uh, was not much of a town at that point in time, and he was really out in the country. And uh, he, in fact, sectioned off a portion of his original farm and created the town of Darmstadt, Illinois, which is still there today. So if you go to Darmstadt, Illinois, that was the original Eckert farm. Um, Darmstadt today is probably a town of only 300 people, but it is still there and, and thriving as it ever has. But um, Why didn't he call it Eckert, Illinois? <laughs> well, uh, I guess the story that I had on it is there was two gentlemen, there were two gentlemen in that area, and one was from uh, Darmstadt, uh, Germany, and the other, my ancestor, Johann Eckert, was from Dietzenbach, Germany. Well, Dietzenbach was too hard to pronounce, so they decided to call it Darmstadt, and uh, that's how the story went. What was it about the soil and the weather conditions, the growing conditions here in this part of Illinois that um, appealed to them? Well, specifically, I can't answer the question, but what I would say is climate-wise, there's a lot of similarities between here and Germany, maybe a little bit warmer here, but uh, rolling hills, and uh, at that time, you know, there was good access to this part of the country because of the river. Um, you know, when you got west of here, there was very limited access, and uh, even inland, it was harder access because most people came in on riverboat and then had to take horseback to get to whatever settlement they were going to at that time. So that's how they ended up here. They came by river to St. Louis and then went by horseback out to uh, the St. Labore area. And how far would this area be from St. Louis? We are about 15 miles east of St. Louis. 
So a day's ride for them. Yeah, it was about a day's ride to here and then, you know, another 15 miles further east from here. So it's probably two days ride uh, okay. to actually get to the section of the country where they settled. The country where they settled, is it a little bit richer, loamy soil than it is here? Pretty similar to here, maybe not quite as hilly as this, but uh, soil types are similar. Do you know what kind of agriculture they were pursuing back in Germany? It was a typical farm of that time. It was primarily livestock and grain. Uh, of course, soybeans weren't the thing back then. It was wheat and rye and corn, um, but uh, livestock was a big part of it. And as on many farms in that time, they had a small orchard. Uh, and it was not the mainstay of their business, but it was a, a portion of producing food for the family. And this would have been back in Germany we're talking about. Y or Germany both sides. and here. Mm -hmm. Uh, so from what you just described, it didn't take them long to decide to plant a few trees at least. It was very commonplace. Uh, it was primarily just to supply the fruit seller of the home, uh, that you would have some fruit production on the farm. Well, here's the tough part of the interview for you probably. That's the first generation, 1837. Can you take us up generation by generation? And I'm especially interested in how the use of the land and maybe the location and the procurement of land has evolved over time. I can walk you through it explicitly. Okay. Um, we, uh, let's see, Johann Eckert settled outside of St. Labore in uh, what is now Darmstadt, Illinois. He had a son, Michael Eckert, and as was the case in those days, he bought farms and gave each of his sons a different farm. Uh, I'm only going to explain about Michael Eckert because that was where I descended from. Michael Eckert was given a farm on a piece of property just outside of the town of Fayetteville. And that farm was called Drum Hill Farm. And we still own and operate that farm today. Uh, Michael took ownership of that farm in the 1840s and he built a home on that farm in 1855 and that home still is there today. Uh, and Michael had uh, a son by the name of Henry Eckert. Henry Eckert uh, was uh, a farmer as well and he moved to this farm here in Belleville and married Mary Miller. Uh, this was a Miller farm. This is where her parents uh, lived and uh, farmed, and they uh, got married, and Mary's parents gave them the farm here at Belleville. And How many acres? Any idea? Well, at that time, I believe it was about 100 acres that was given to Henry and Mary. And at that day and age, that's a lot of land. Yeah, that was a good-sized farming operation at that time. Uh, Henry had a son named Alvin and Alvin continued the farming operation and moved into the same home as uh, Henry uh, built right here on this farm. Uh, at that time, they also bought some more ground. They bought the 100 acres on this side of Greenmount Road, uh, which was also a, a Miller farm, but it was another uh, ancestor, not Mary's parents. It was uh, an uncle. What were the Millers doing with the land? They were farming. This was a, a, a uh, grain and livestock farm, and uh, it wasn't really until uh, Henry came along that we really expanded into more fruit production. Henry enjoyed fruit production um, and planted more acres. Alvin Eckert, Henry's son, was really the entrepreneur. He had all kinds of ideas about things he wanted to try, and he expanded into the direct farm marketing, more fruit production, more vegetable production, and uh, also had a little bit of that entertainment blood in his uh, system too because he actually had a Wild West rodeo show <laughs> that he and another partner put together and they traveled all over the western part of the United States doing Wild West shows. And the story goes that they went bankrupt out somewhere. They ran out of money and they couldn't get home. They had to wire back to grandma to get cash to get them back to Belleville so they could get home. So That would have been his mother, you mean? No, that would have been his wife. Ah, okay. <laughs> it was Alvin's wife. Uh, Alvin's wife, her name was Ella. 
and she was a stickler. She was a tough nut. So I'm sure he had a lot to answer to when he got home after that trip. Um, Ella Heinrich is what I believe. For a lot, that was her maiden name? Ella Heinrich. Well, these are all good German names. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, the interesting thing is that I'm the, the seventh generation of my family to be here, and I'm pretty much 100% German bloodline still. So it kind of gives you an idea of the depth of German heritage that exists in this, uh, in this area right here. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about Alvin and Ella? It sounds like quite a couple. Yeah, they were a, a, an interesting couple. I'd, I only have faint memories of Ella. I'd never met Alvin. He died long before I uh, was born. But uh, Alvin, as I said, was a real entrepreneur and uh, a real promoter. And he really kind of expanded into the retail business and, and saw a lot of opportunity in getting more margin for the crops you produce, being able to sell it directly to the consumer. So at that time, you saw us expand a lot more into diversified group of fruits and vegetables so that he could expand his farm marketing operation. When you say farm marketing, did he have a roadside stand or did he sell the grocery stores around the area or what? It was a roadside stand. It was Alvin O. Eckert uh, brand uh, farm. Uh, I think it, I'm trying to remember this. I think it was Alvin O. Eckert Turkey Hill brand is what the, the sign said on the storefront. And I, we have some pictures of that we could share with you. Now there is a building right down by your current restaurant in your operation called mm -hmm. Turkey Hill, right? That is the Turkey Hill Grange of which my family is a longtime supporter of the Grange. And uh, you know, Grange actually started out as a farm family fraternity. It was more like a farmer's union that did some lobbying to support farmers around the country. And uh, this particular Grange right here is still very active and very strong. Uh, a lot of the Granges have since gone out of existence, but uh, Turkey Hill has remained very successful. Um, but Oops, I didn't see that phone. <laughs> okay. I can't really move, I guess, but my wife might be coming up to get it. That's her cell phone. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit more about Ella? And this would be your great-grandmother? This is my great-grandmother. Ella Eckert was, um, a, a, I don't have more than just faint memories of her in her very last years uh, on, on this planet, but uh, she was a stickler and was very tough. And she really drove a lot of the kids to working and working tough. Uh, so there, there's a lot of good stories about her. and and her work ethic and her drive and her insistence upon doing things well. And, and uh, the old saying that my grandmother always had about Ella was that anything worth doing is worth doing well. And that was really a motto by which the whole family lived by at, uh, through her generation and I think still today. You know, it's really about committing yourself to doing things at a, at a level that other people aren't willing to. But it, from what you've said, it sounds like Ella was the structured, grounded one, and Alvin was the adventurous spirit in the family. That's right. I think that's a very accurate description of the family. And after Al Alvin, uh, what comes along? Alvin had three sons. Alvin and Ella had three sons, and uh, they were also very committed to education. Uh, all three of the sons uh, went to the University of Illinois and got degrees in agriculture. And uh, which is somewhat unique for that time in the in the 20s, uh, to far farm families to send all of their children to university to study agriculture. Um, they all went off, and uh, after college, they all came back and started working in the farming operation. And of course, that brought a lot more resource back to the business and allowed for a lot of growth at that time. But the farm was not subdivided among the various sons, and apparently that wasn't the case for a few generations. Right. Um, the, uh, along the way, um, uh, Henry Eckert had another son, Eugene, uh, who did take so another farm and, and farm it down uh, in a different location. But Alvin stayed here and farmed the home farm. Um, Alvin, when his sons came back into the business, uh, created a partnership with his sons, Alvin O. Eckert and Sons Orchards. Um, 
they all shared the ownership of the business and the, and the responsibilities of the business. And it grew very rapidly at that time. And that was right around the era of the Great Depression, which actually was a very prosperous time for our farming operation. You know, some farms really suffered at that time, but the other farms that weren't really affected by the Dust Bowl did prosper through some of those years. You said it grew. Did it grow in size or just the diversity and the prosperity of the farm? It grew primarily in size. And in the 30s was really a growth stage in terms of adding acres and new farms to the mix. So in the 1930s, we purchased a farm in Millstadt, Illinois, that we still own today. We purchased a farm about two miles east of here, and we purchased two other locations about 10 miles east of here. Uh, all in a, a period of about 10 years. So we, we added about, uh, we about tripled our acreage in a, in a 10 years time frame uh, through the 30s. Well, I know that throughout the entire 1920s and especially into the 30s, those were tough economic times, especially on the farm. In, mm -hmm. the, in the 20s, the rest of the, the society was doing very well, but farming had been depressed ever since World War I. So what was it about what Alvin was doing with his property that was so different from what the rest of the farmers in the area? Primarily, doing. I think it was the direct farm marketing. You know, being able to produce crops that you sell directly to consumers allowed us to take advantage of those margins that existed for retailers, but not for farmers in that time frame. And at the same time, once you got into the Depression, the farm economy did rebound more quickly than some of the other economies. So we were not necessarily in the uh, the grain business so much is more the livestock and the fruit and vegetable business which allowed us to have higher uh, value crops that were also marketed directly to the public so it was kind of a, a double win for them at that time they were really able to profit. Were some of these other farms that he was acquiring then to traditional uh, livestock and grain farms that were then being converted into other uses? Yes we were buying what were livestock and grain farms and planting fruit trees on them. We did have a, lot, a large livestock operation at the same time. We were raising hogs and cattle and chickens uh, that were all being raised to be sold in our own retail. So we had a slaughterhouse and we're slaughtering our own animals and selling fresh meat at the meat counter at the roadside market and also fresh eggs. So it was a totally integrated operation that allowed you to capitalize on all of the added value of the crops. Well, with all of these things that you're producing, though, it sounds like somewhere along the line you grew beyond the roadside stand. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, through the 40s uh, and the 50s, the market, the roadside stand, really became more a market and then became a grocery store. Um, there was a lot of traffic uh, going by our stand, and uh, we were somewhat unique to have a grocery store out in a more rural setting that the farm community could really depend upon uh, was something that worked for us. And it was uh, also a time when the independent grocer was really doing well. Um, that went on for quite some time, but then when you got to the 70s and the 80s, when you saw a lot of consolidation in the grocery industry, and the independent grocer really went out of business is when we again changed our format into a more seasonal farm market or country store that focused on the seasons of crops that we produce and really trying to capitalize on large volume in a shorter season. Mm -hmm. And was it the 70s and 80s that you started to rely more heavily on the St. Louis market explicitly? I would say the St. Louis market has been a part of our marketing strategy ever since we opened. You know, it's just there's been more population around here because we're close to St. Louis and more traffic because mm -hmm. we're close to St. Louis. So it's always benefited us. Um, Alvin and Ella had three sons. Mm -hmm. And uh, which side of those three sons should we be paying attention to here? Well, all three of them were active integral parts of our business, but my grandfather was Kurt Eckert. And uh, Kurt married Ruth Staub and they had three children also. Um, Kurt and Ruth lived here on the Belleville farm and built this home right here. There, there's actually another home that was here prior to this that was a Miller home that they moved into. Um, they uh, were living here for some years. I don't know, I, I can't remember how many, but probably 15 years, 10 or 15 years. 
And while they were out of town on a trip, lightning struck the house and the house burned to the ground. And uh, the story goes that uh, since we're on top of this big hill here, everybody in the community saw the fire starting and everyone came up here and saw that there was no one home and took everything out of the house and put it in the yard. And nothing was lost in the fire. All the furniture was saved. All of the uh, keepsakes were saved. And uh, the house was totally lost. It's hard to see something like that happening today. <laughs> yeah. And, and having the furniture in your yard and not in somebody yeah. else's house. <laughs> but I'm, I'm thinking also that Alvin and Ella have three sons. They all have children. So there's a lot of cousins and there are a lot of ways that this land, this business could have been divided. And yet it wasn't divided. Mm -hmm. Well, what happened, um, the three brothers, uh, Kurt, Cornell, and Vernon, those are Alvin's sons. Um, they formed a corporation, and all of the assets of the business were held in the corporation. What year would that have been? Uh, that was in the 50s, 60s era when the corporations were formed. They uh, passed those shares of ownership on to their children. Uh, Kurt had three, Vernon had three, and Cornell had none. Um, so all of those assets were then passed on to the next generation, which would be my parents' generation, as shares of stock in the business. And so what you see is a, there's a, a much larger group of ownership today if, of the business, and all of the shareholders seem to be uh, pretty excited to be a participant in the business at this point in time, and nobody's willing to sell any shares. So uh, I think uh, we've uh, the offer w was always out there if so somebody would want to cash out of the business that we would, uh, you know, tr obligate that we're obligated to do that and would, uh, would be, uh, you know, happy to, to uh, offer them a buyout of their st stock, but uh, nobody has pursued that at this point in time. And as a result, uh, we were pretty fortunate, you know, the business has been allowed to flourish and grow and uh, not have to liquidate any assets to uh, buy back stock mm -hmm. or anything like that. And we have put plans in place for the future generations so that operations can be consolidated into the hands of the people who are running the business and maintain the focus of the business than in the people who are operating it and feel like they know best what to do with the business. Mm -hmm. uh, Kurtz, your grandfather? Yeah. And uh, your father's name, again, is Larry? Larry. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, was it important to the family to continue that tradition that apparently Alvin had established that the sons go off to school and get a good education? Absolutely. And uh, uh, we all have attended college and uh, the University of Illinois. We are all graduates of the University of Illinois. There's been, I believe, uh, 13 Eckerts go to the University of Illinois and get degrees. And uh, What's, uh, What kind of degrees have those 13 gotten? Well, the various degrees, you know, as the generations go by, they get a little more dispersed. But uh, my degree is in agricultural economics. My wife's degree is uh, from University of Illinois. She wasn't an Eckert then, but is an Eckert now, so she passed the test. So, uh, but uh, no, her degree is in uh, ornamental horticulture from the College of Aces at the University of Illinois. Um, my sister has a degree in communication from the University of Illinois, so it's not in the College of Aces, but liberal arts, and uh, my other sister's got an education degree, uh, primary education degree from the University of Illinois. So um, while a lot of us have stayed the course on agriculture, the, we are getting more dispersed in our uh, academic profession. So, Well, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about you and what it was like growing up in this big family and a big family business as well. Um, tell us a little bit about the chores you had. Well, I lived on, I grew up on our Milstadt farm, and, uh, you know, it's strictly an apple farm. That's the only crop we produce there. So I didn't have a lot of farm chores growing up. I didn't have to, you know, collect eggs and milk the, milk the cows or anything like that. But um, once we were old enough, we were brought to Belleville to work in the business here, and our first job, all of us, our first job was folding pans for the peach line. And pans, we, we have a, a cardboard box, it's a two-quart pan, 
and they have to be folded and it's been the same box for I think 150 years but uh, it seems like that's every young Eckert's responsibility is to start out folding pans you get paid a penny a pan and uh, you see how many you can fold in a day um, so that was always the first job and and then it kind of it goes from there but we uh, we all worked many hours in the business especially through the summer uh, mostly in the country store here helping out with selling peaches and produce and bakery was there any one of the three brothers at that time who seemed to have a bigger role in the operation more in charge of things it was I would say pretty evenly split they all had their areas of responsibility that they enjoyed um, my grandfather was really uh, responsible at that time for the livestock operation and also for kind of the financial management of the business. Uh, Vernon Eckert was responsible for the retail end of the business. Cornell Eckert was responsible for the horticulture end of the business. So they kind of shared some responsibilities, but each had their individual passions that they pursued. Does that mean that by the 50s and 60s there was also a nursery or a garden store along with this? That really didn't get started up until the 70s uh, as part of the country store uh, model of the mm -hmm. retail business. Okay. Well, I, I want to talk about that a little bit more detail, so let's, I don't want to go there too far right now. What were family gatherings like for the Eckerts? Our family is uh, steeped in traditions and... Uh, you know, we always celebrated Christmas Eve in this home. It, my grandmother had Christmas Eve. That was just the bottom line. And up until the year before she passed away, we would celebrate Christmas Eve in this house. And uh, that's some of my fondest memories of family gatherings. One of the things that we always did on Christmas Eve is all of the kids would get together and write a skit. We always did skits that made fun of the parents. And we would perform them right here in this room, and all the parents would sit around and get a big kick out of us making fun of them. And uh, that, we had a lot of fun. But then you always had the whole anxiety of, we got to write this dumb skit. What are we doing? I don't know. But we had a blast doing it. There, it was always such fond memories of that. And my, my cousins and myself, we always uh, joke about that still today. And we're about ready to start that tradition back up because the next generation is getting to the age where they can start to do it again. Um, but then we all we all had other traditions too. We always celebrated Easter at Uncle Cornell's house, and we always celebrated uh, Thanksgiving at my parents' house. And uh, so we had areas where we all had to go to, and we all ate dinner together. It didn't matter what kind of problems we were having with the business that year, or what disagreements you might have had about a decision. You always sat down at the dinner table together. And where along your youth did you decide that you wanted to follow in with the family business or was there even ever a choice <laughs> about that? Oh there's always a choice and in fact uh, it's a rule in our business that you cannot come back and work for the family business after you've graduated college. Uh, you know to be back in the business you have to have a college degree and you have to have at least two years of professional experience outside of the business and uh, uh, for two reasons. One, if you're coming back here, they want to make sure that you're ready for it and that you're committed to it. And for two, if you do come back here, they want you to bring some experience. You know, we want you to come in and, and bring some new perspective because we don't get a lot of new senior management in this family business. So when you get somebody, you want to make sure they bring new new blood to the table. So I, I uh, from a very young age, uh, ever since I can remember, have loved the farm and loved what we do and I can remember as, um, you know, I had my toy tractors in the sandbox and I played pick your own. You know, I had the, the wagons and we were loading people up and picking apples in the backyard. And uh, so I, I've always uh, had a passion for what we do and it was never a problem getting me to be involved in the farm. It was always a problem keeping me at home uh, when I was too young to be on the farm. So um, I, I've always had a passion for it and I, I've always loved being in it. Uh, ever had a doubt of where you'd be going to college? Uh, no, I have always wanted to, <laughs> you know, that's the only college I knew. Is there another one? <laughs> so, uh, no, I've uh, I've always uh, been very proud of my academic years at U University of Illinois and, and what the university does. I think it's a, a great testament to the quality of agriculture in our state. What class did you graduate from? I graduated in 94. 
uh, from College of Aces. At that time, it was a College of Agriculture. And why agriculture economics for you? Well, the University of Illinois doesn't have uh, a lot of uh, depth when it comes to fruit production. I mean, let's face it, Illinois is not uh, known for uh, thousands and thousands of acres of fruit production. Mm -hmm. So I, I took all of the fruit production classes that were offered, but what's really probably more important to our success long term is having a good financial sense about how the business is run. And I really had more keen interest in uh, the financial coursework than uh, going more into agronomy or uh, crop sciences. You said that's part of the tradition that you spend two years doing something else before you come back to farm. Uh, you graduated in 1994. Mm -hmm. Did you have the intent in 1994 to return to this business? Um, well, I knew the rules, so I knew I was going to have to go somewhere else for a period of time, but uh, my intent was long-term to be back here. So what were the two years that you spent? I had a great time. Um, I spent a year living in Boston, uh, and I worked for a supermarket chain out there called Shaw's Supermarkets. And, and it happened at the time that the CEO of Shaw's Supermarket was a graduate from the College of Agriculture at the University of Illinois as well. And uh, Dean Olson, who I, I've got the utmost admiration for, uh, got me an interview uh, with Shaw Supermarkets through his contact at Shaw's, and, um, and I got on as a buyer, a corporate buyer of uh, apples. I was, the, I was buying apples for all of their stores. And uh, I had a, a great time there, and it was a, a wonderful learning experience for me, and I, I uh, enjoyed it very much. Um, I got married a year after college, and uh, my where'd wife. You, where did you meet your wife? Uh, Angie uh, and I met in high school. And uh, Angie lived in Belleville. And uh, we went to Belleville West High School together. And her maiden name? Baker. It's B-O-E-K-E-R. And uh, Angie and I met in civics class freshman year. And we had civics and honors algebra together uh, freshman year. I remember she didn't like me. She thought I was arrogant. <laughs> cocky and cocky football player but uh, we uh, we ended up starting to date um, our senior year in, in high school and dated in college we both went to the University of Illinois her first job was working at Eckerd's Country Store as a, in the bakery counter was it just a fluke that both of you end up at the uh, University of Illinois both of her parents are U of I graduates as well so okay. you know we got a lot of legacy there and uh, um, but, and she was interested in uh, in plants as well in biology and it was kind of just uh, over a course of a, a year at the University of Illinois that she kind of figured out that she wanted to be in ornamental horticulture so when she got out of college she had an internship at um, uh, oh, I can't remember the name she had an internship out in Philadelphia at a garden out there um, I, I'm blanking out can't remember the name of it right now no problem but um, and then she was wanting to go to graduate school and so right before we got married she got a full ride scholarship to go to Ohio State to get her master's degree in agricultural education so uh, I ended up leaving my job in Boston and we both moved to Columbus Ohio and I took another job as a production manager for a company called Custom Cuts it's not the haircut place. Uh, it's the place where you make salad mixes for restaurants, like you see in the store, all the salad mixes that they uh, sell. We would chop up heads of lettuce and heads of cabbage and send them off to the restaurants for, uh, for them to make salads with. So uh, I was there for a year, and, and then we ended up moving back here, and I uh, worked in, uh, in the farming operations. Um. Does that mean your wife had one year graduate school there in Ohio or more? Uh, Angie was at Ohio State for a year and a half, and um, she completed her... <laughs> Should we wait until... No, that's okay. It's okay. Um, Angie was at Ohio State for a year and a half. She completed her master's degree in a year and a half. I moved home actually six months before she was finished. I moved home in July and she finished up in December. And uh, we had a farm at that time in Bonterre, Missouri. And we had made the decision to not replant that orchard and sell off the farm. And before 
we had the har the crop harvested, the farm manager decided he was going to find another job and found it and left. So we were kind of left with this farm that needed to be closed down. And uh, they asked me if I wanted to come home and do that and, and then start working full time because they knew I was interested in moving back and, and working here. You had a farm in Missouri mm -hmm. that you had purchased or that you were renting or what? We had a farm in Missouri that we had purchased back in the 70s and had uh, a pick your own apple orchard down there for a long time. We being the family, obviously. Yeah, the Eckert's, uh, the family. And, uh, and uh, you know, a span of a lifespan of an apple tree is about 20 years. Well, at the end of the lifespan of that orchard, the decision was made it wasn't worth investing in pl replanting it, that it kind of had run its course and uh, they were going to sell the farm off. So uh, I came back and helped close that down and auction off the equipment and get everything shut down and closed up. And, and then I came back here to Belleville and uh, started working in the farming operation here. Would it be fair to say that the family called you back to work for them or did you, <laughs> were you in constantly inquiring, hey, when can I come back? Um, no, it was really kind of a fluke timing issue. Uh, I was, the, the company that I had worked for in Columbus was struggling, not doing too well, and um, I was saying, all right, I'm going to have to make a move here because this is not a long-term solution <laughs> with this organization. And at the same time, it was happening with our farming operation here that they were going to need somebody. So uh, it was just kind of mutual. It wasn't like uh, a, lo a long time premeditated decision. It was just kind of happenstance that it worked out. Okay. What I'd like to do next then for the next series of questions is get a sense of how the business has grown over time as well. Mm -hmm. And we established that it was about, I think you said 1910 that the, uh, the roadside stand started. Mm -hmm. um, about what time would it have been that that turned into what we would consider a normal uh, grocery operation? Well, in 1910, our roadside stand was actually in a different location. It was a, about a mile up the road here. And in 1929, we actually built the roadside stand that we have here in Belleville along Highway 15. It was a traditional roadside market and had uh, fresh fruits and vegetables. And then probably in the 30s, we added a meat counter to that store. And then over time, we added another wing to it, and that became a little bit bigger produce department. And probably about 1945 or so, it became a grocery store. When did the Pick Your Own operation begin? Uh, the first Pick Your Own operation opened in 1965 up in Grafton. That was our first Pick Your Own farm. We bought that farm in the 30s. Um, and it was a strictly a, a wholesale apple production farm. And uh, then uh, it, it, we decided to go into the, the pick your own business uh, at that location just because we felt it was uh, an easy way to get our feet wet with the business. Once we saw it working up there, we, we expanded it into our Milstadt farm and also out into Freeburg. We had an, an apple orchard out in Freeburg. So we had three pick your own apple orchards. How large was each one of these? Each one of them was pretty large. I mean, uh, probably in the neighborhood of 75 to 125 acres of apples, um, pretty large apple production farms. Is it typical that if you have, um, you know, 100 acres of land that you'd have 90 to 95 acres or 100 acres of, of apple trees as well? Um, it, it depends on the property. It depends on, you know, the soil conditions, if you have wet spots or wooded areas or things like that. But most of the farms at that point in time were large apple orchards. Apples, but not peaches at that time. Not so much peaches. Uh, peaches were a part of the operation, but not a big part. We were really much bigger apple growers through the 40s and the 50s, and then especially in the 60s and 70s, we really expanded into a lot of apple acreage. At our peak, which is in the 70s, we were, we were growing close to 700 acres of apples, and most of that was being produced for wholesale. We had two packing houses. We had a packing house in Carbondale, Illinois, and we had a, a whole uh, operation down there of about uh, 400 acres of apple orchards and different operations there. That was really expanded into in the mid-50s to mid-60s. We made two purchases of other farms in the Carbondale-Cobden area. 
was there something particular about the soil and the conditions here that made it more conducive for apple versus the huge grain operations we'd see farther east? What you find is that the soil here is not as productive for grain as it is in central Illinois. So while you might get production of 200 to 220 bushels an acre in central Illinois today, uh, in this area you might get 150 bushels to the acre. So you're getting quite a bit more productivity in corn in central Illinois than you would in this area. You also see more hills in this area, which is better for fruit production. So apples and peaches are going to grow better in this type of ground than they would in Champaign County. Uh, they don't like that flat, loamy stuff because it, it can get too wet and uh, make the trees have wet feet or wet roots and not thrive in the soil. Is that why uh, rolling hills is better for orchards? Yes, more well-drained soils. Additionally, what you really want to have is higher elevation because the other enemy in fruit production is frost. When you're in bloom, uh, you can get frost damage, and when you're up on top of the hill, it's going to be warmer than in the valleys. Mm -hmm. So anytime you've been on a oh, calm summer night and you had your hand, hand outside the window of a car and you drive down a hill, you notice it gets cooler as you go down and warmer as you come up. Well, that's air separation, and warmer air is always going to rise and colder air is going to settle. So you'll notice even if you look at our farms today, the apple orchards or peach orchards don't go all the way to the bottom of the hill. They start kind of on the upslope of the hill and go over the top of the hill. You mentioned when you're really in the peat production phase of the, uh, the family operation and doing apples, uh, that it was primarily wholesale market. Does that mean you were marketing to a much wider area? Yes. Uh, when we were growing lots of acres of apples, we were a regional producer, so we were shipping apples, you know, to Indiana, Ohio, and Tennessee, and Texas, and Michigan, and Wisconsin, and Missouri, you know, anywhere we could find markets for large volumes of fruit. And that became really unprofitable for us because we had such an influx of added acreage on the West Coast, primarily Washington State. And when the freeway system really got developed and going and, and transportation with refrigerated trailers became uh, much more affordable, you saw all of this fruit coming in from the West Coast that was grown in an arid climate that was more conducive for higher quality finishes on apples. And so supermarkets said, well, we can buy this fruit that's better looking from the West Coast and not have to worry about... Uh, your apples anymore. So suddenly Illinois apples became less desirable and less profitable to produce. Uh, did that cause a lot of concern, angst in the family then? Well, uh, yes, and you know, there's always angst and concern, you know, there's always <laughs> the new threat. So that's not something that's new or that is not something that will go away anytime soon. I think anytime you're in your own business, you have to change with the times and that's one of the exciting things about being in our business and one of the reasons I think we've been successful is because we're not scared of diversifying, we're not scared of trying things a lot of times um, that has allowed us to succeed over time. Um, so to discuss if you could the evolution from apples to peaches or maybe there was something in between there as well. What we found was we could be very successful growing apples for the pick your own and direct market business. That's still a very vibrant and successful part of our business and will continue to be for the foreseeable future. But you only need about 100 to 150 acres of apples to do that. And we had a lot bigger farming footprint than 150 acres. You know, we were farming 1,000 acres at that time. So we were looking for things that we could do with the property to generate profitable income. And at the same time, uh, we were coming off kind of a cold weather pattern into a warmer weather pattern. And if you look back, you know, we've got crop production records back into 1940. And, you know, people talk a lot today about global warming, but if you look at our production history, uh, there was a period from 1940 to 1970 that was pretty warm. And we were pretty successful with peach crops for a 30-year stretch. We only had two peach crop losses in that 30-year stretch. From 1970 to 1990, we had about eight peach crop failures. So it was a real disaster for peaches in those, that 20-year period. 
But what happened is we also had to get out of the apple business. We had too many acres of apples. And we sold off some ground, all of our ground in Carbondale and the Cobden area, we sold off and got out of that production region. But we still had a lot of acres of, of farms in this area. And we thought, well, maybe we can plant peaches around here on better sites and get us a little bit better productivity. So even in years when we have light crops, we still have enough peaches to sell in our store. Well, so we added about 50 acres of peaches to our normal production. And what happened is we started getting warmer. The temperatures started going up and we had fewer freeze outs. And suddenly we found ourselves with excess peach production every year and realized we needed to get into the peach wholesale business. So we uh, actually, at the same time decided, well, let's plant some more acres. So we've gone from about 100 acres in peach production in 1990 up to about 220 acres of peach production today. And we've also gone from not wholesaling peaches at all to today we're wholesaling 75% of our crop. And it's a very successful and profitable crop for us to wholesale. Are there any other crops currently that you're wholesaling? No, peaches are the only crop. And you already mentioned that uh, peaches is a little bit riskier in terms of the weather. Uh, what's it been like for the last 15, 20 years? Well, since 1990, we've lost two peach crops. Uh, one was in 1996, and one was last year. So we're in a pretty good cycle of uh, not losing too many crops. In addition to that, um, we've had uh, the added benefit of crop insurance for apples and peaches which really takes the downside risk out of it. It's still, when you lose a crop like we did last year, you're going to lose money. But you don't have to sell the farm to make up for the lost crop. Um, without crop insurance, you're in a real financial disaster. Can you tell us a little bit more about the crop insurance? Is this commercial or is it government-backed, a combination of both? It's a combination of both. It's government-backed crop insurance, and uh, the policies are written by the USDA but they're, uh, they're carried by uh, national crop insurance companies. Um, the U.S. government subsidizes the, the premiums on the policy, so that's the only way it really makes it affordable, but it's still a very expensive policy for us to carry. But it does take a lot of the risk away for us. When you say you lost a crop, does that mean that you only harvested maybe 50% of the previous year, or is this like a dramatic loss? You lost everything. Yeah, when I say we lost a crop, it means we had 2% of a peach crop last year. <laughs> so it was basically an entire <laughs> loss. And in our apple crop, we only had about 15% of our apple crop. So it, last year was a rare exception to the rule. We've only had a situation like that one other time in our family's history, and that was in 1955. Is this something that's different for somebody who's doing the, the specialty crops, especially orchards, versus somebody who's in grain and a livestock operation? The crop insurance programs are very similar. Uh, they deal with uh, crops in the same way in terms of annual production averages and um, how they look at uh, premiums. You know, you can insure a certain percentage of your crop, you know, whether it's 50% or 70% or whatever. So it's handled in a very similar way to uh, corn and soybeans. But I would think the scale is a lot different. I mean, a bad year for a soybean grower might be 50% yield. Is that not correct? Yeah. I mean, it, it, you can buy in at whatever level okay. you want to protect yourself on. So I'm sure, you know, grain farmers might buy in at an 80% you know, level or a 75% level. We participate at a 50% level. Um, simply because the premiums get too expensive beyond that. So the government or the insurance policy would cover you for 50% of the value of a typical crop. Right. Okay. Right. Um, what other government policies have been important to your particular family operation? Well, you know, in fruit production, there's not a lot of government subsidies that are in the form of direct payments or anything like that. So the programs that we really uh, enjoy and have benefited us would be more like the CRP program or the CSP program or equip programs that allow us to build terraces and do water conservation projects. CRP like and CSP being? Yeah. Uh, CSP is, I can't remember, conservation 
sustainability program, I think. Um, and that is really designed to help with the expense of putting in waterways and um, preventing erosion and uh, doing certain types of production techniques that reduce erosion and, and different uh, and conservation and improve conservation techniques in your farming operation. Okay, and going back to some of the other diverse activities you've got, when did the restaurant come along? We started uh, with a small restaurant in our corner of our country store. <laughs> I've got a friend over here. Is she getting on the mic? No, she's fine. Okay. Um, the uh, first restaurant started in about 1985 in a corner of our country store. And uh, we had eight tables. And uh, we uh, served just lunches out of our bakery. And uh, we ventured into the restaurant business in a much bigger way in 1998. And we expanded our uh, restaurant into what was our slaughterhouse. <laughs> <coughs> the slaughterhouse business went out in the 70s. We stopped doing that business. And, uh, um, and then it was kind of a vacant facility. So then we expanded into, uh, I think the family's coming back asleep now. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, we expanded into the restaurant business in that same space. The country store, is that the, an evolution of what the grocery store used to be? Yeah. The uh, country store it, that we have today is what our roadside market was. Uh, in our grocery, it was a roadside market, became a grocery store, and now is our country store. And same thing for the bakery? The bakery was started as a department within the grocery store originally, and then really expanded into our country store in the, in the late 70s and 80s and has continued to thrive since then. Uh, what things do you specialize in the bakery? Uh, a big thing for us is our pies, fruit pies in particular with, you know, with logical reasoning. Um, but we also started to come up with a line of our own products that are kind of signature products by season. Uh, peaches and cream cake, apple, uh, apple cakes, uh, muffins. Um, humble pie. There's, you know, as we've added more items, we've been able to expand the business in that department. And how about uh, fresh meats, deli prepared foods? Is that also something that originated in the uh, when it was more of a grocery store operation? Well, you know, we started out with livestock in a slaughterhouse and a fresh meat counter, and that flourished for a long time. And then we actually got out of meat completely. We didn't have a meat counter at all in our store for probably 20 years, and it was just uh, four years ago that we reintroduced a meat counter in our stores. We see the population growing around us and the potential to have more year-round sales. Meat is a nice addition because people eat meat 12 months out of the year, and we have a great supply of high-quality meats available for us here in the local market. So it's a way for us to support local farmers, too. All of our meats are sourced locally. Um, and we try to promote them in our store at the same time. What caused the family to get out of the uh, meat business, though? It really was a factor of changing dynamics in regulation and also the way people shop and buy meat. You know, that was really when the local grocer had, was, you know, everyone went to the local butcher shop or the local grocer to get their meats for the week. And then all of a sudden, the mega mart started coming along, and people were going to the one-stop shopping. And we're seeing kind of a resurgence of the independent grocer and the independent specialty shop today. People are very excited about supporting local agriculture today, and they want to know where their food comes from, and they'll pay a little extra for that. And that's something that we uh, also are excited about for obvious reasons, but we, think, we believe in it. We believe you get better food when you source it locally. And the closer uh, you are to the, to the tree where your fruit was produced or the ranch where your, your uh, beef was raised, the, the better the quality of that meat typically is. So do you meet, see people coming, or coming from this, the uh, St. Louis metro area all the way over here to get what they would consider the high quality organic foods? I wouldn't say that it's as much of a destination business from St. Louis, but we're able to draw from our local community in a better way. Um, you know, there's uh, 150,000 people that live on this side of the river. So there's a, there's a large group of people that we can pull from mm -hmm. uh, to sell our products locally. 
wine cellar. Is that a newer addition? Wine is a new addition. It was added the same time as our meat counter. And again, it was in an effort to look at how do we attract customers on a year-round basis. And also, it's what, what things are we excited about? You know, there's been a great uh, resurgence of, in the wine business. Uh, people are drinking a lot more wine today than they ever have. And there's so many wonderful wines out there, but it's a lot about education and identifying with your customers so that they get over the hurdles that they're afraid of buying wine. I saw you had your own vines out here. You talked about peaches being converted into peach wine, but none of that is happening on site. Mm -hmm. uh, are these all local wines that you're featuring, though? Absolutely not. We, uh, we really see wine as a global market. You know, there's great wines from all over the world and that includes Illinois and Missouri, but why limit yourself to just those and you can't get Cabernet from a local wine, you know, mm -hmm. winemaker. So uh, we really want to have great wines from all over the world and uh, great values and also just hard to find stuff. And the custard shop, when did that come along? Custard shop started in the 80s, which is it's frozen custard, it's ice cream, uh, but it's got a higher butter fat content to it and it's not got any air whipped into it so it's really unhealthy and great <laughs> so uh, we think it's wonderful because you put fresh fruit on top of it and it like cancels out the bad part of the custard well I've overlooked one thing which your wife would probably be upset about the garden center mm -hmm. when did the garden center get added we had a uh, kind of a seasonal garden center attached to our country store for many years. I think it started in the 70s and uh, went on f up until the uh, late 90s. My wife has a degree in ornamental horticulture and has worked in botanical gardens uh, and is extremely passionate about her, uh, her plants. So uh, when we got married and moved back here, uh, she was tapped as a, a resource to make our our plant business stronger and then we saw an opportunity uh, that a, was a flourishing business in the 90s and uh, we saw an opportunity to capitalize on that and build a new garden center and kind of restructure our whole retail facility and we did that we built a, a large garden center and um, she managed that exclusively for probably five or six years and it's something that's a, a great addition to our business it, it uh, it rounds out some of our seasonality because it's really strong in April and May and we uh, we find that as a local market grows it's another thing that people are looking for and and like to buy locally because it has a strong educational component to it and we can we have a strong staff that it can educate our customers about all the plants that we have uh, I'm gonna put you on the spot a little bit it's such a diverse operation that you have now um, I wonder if you can kind of prioritize what the more important or more profitable aspects of the business are and what things aren't quite as profitable as you'd like and then maybe transition into what the future looks like. Absolutely, and we talk about this all the time. I think that going into the next three to five years, our first priority is to try to build a new country store joining our garden center. We, we really see a lot of opportunity in developing the local market into a stronger retail base for us. We see lots of great trends in the industry for local foods, local plants, local suppliers to do well and we want to be ahead of that curve and and be competitive in a marketplace that is becoming more competitive. So as Walmart and all of the other things that come along with Walmart go in next door to us we have to raise our bar so that we can be relevant in a changing world. We don't want to become another mom and pop dem uh, stat. You know, we don't want to be one of those that is forced out of business because Walmart came to town. So you can't do what you did for a hundred years and stay in business. You have to evolve. And I think in looking back at our family's history, that's evident that that's what we've done our whole life: is change and evolve and take advantage of the markets that present themselves at the time and we will continue to do that so what we see going forward as our first priority is to try to develop our retail market so that we can justify building a new facility and expanding our retail options after that we see a lot of opportunity in expanding our restaurant 
and taking in things like banquet rooms and expanded seating for our restaurant because as the market expands and as businesses expand in this area there is not as enough resources for meeting space and banquet space and restaurant space after that it's a little unclear you know the the things are always changing we we remain uh, committed to agriculture and that we do not want to diminish our role in agriculture or the number of acres that we're producing on today. We see an opportunity to potentially even increase peach production a certain amount. Um, we want to remain open on the current farms that we have open for pick your own apples and pumpkins. Um, but we're probably not uh, looking to expand with more locations of pick your own farms at this point in time. Would you think that uh, the pick your own operation is uh, more profitable right now than the uh, the wholesale peach market for you or is it how would that sort itself out it's really hard to say that it's more or less profitable uh, wholesale peaches are a very good business for us but it's also very volatile uh, things can change quickly a hailstorm can approach uh, a freeze can approach uh, the market can become saturated and movement slows down and our prices go through the floor. So, you know, there's a lot of things that can impact that very quickly. When it's good, it does very well for us, but it, it can also have some real costs behind it. The pick your own business is a little more manageable for us. We can predict what we're going to do somewhat, but you're also at risk there with weather because most of our business occurs in about three weekends and if we get rain on one of those weekends it has a dramatic negative impact on our sales. What are those three weekends? Well it's the last weekend in September and the first two weekends of October so you know those are very very critical times for us and uh, you know if you get a lot of rain in the fall it is very devastating to your traffic so you know there's things that you have to work with. The nice thing about being diversified like we are is it's rare for them all to happen at the same time. It's rare to have a bad thing happen in three or four different areas of your business in the same year. Um, but at the same time, it's rare to have them all go well. <laughs> so I think uh, you know, diversification comes with its uh, negative sides as well. What seems to be the most stable, consistent aspect of the business? The, the most stability really comes from uh, I, I would say it comes from our pick your own. It's very predictable that people love that part of what we do and it's a big driver for our customer counts. Um, we, we have over a half million customers a year come out to the farm it, and it's such a wonderful experience. We do it better than anybody and uh, I really think it's a, a great experience for families to share with their children. With all of these operations, it obviously doesn't happen just with the family. How many employees would you say you have? We have a hundred, they're about full-time year-round employees, and seasonally we get up to about 400. Uh, so it, it's a big challenge and a big responsibility to make sure that the quality of that staff that we bring in every year is good and also knowledgeable about what we do because in the customer's eyes, they are the family. They are an Eckerd. And I, all of our staff gets asked a lot of times, you know, are you part of the family? And, uh, and we, we're flattered by that. We want our customers to perceive all of our staff as part of an Eckerd, the Eckerd family because they're the face of our business to our consumer. How many of the extended Eckerd family are currently on the payroll? We have five family members currently employed full-time in the business. Uh, myself, my wife Angie, my sister Jill, and uh, my father Larry and his cousin Jim. And what is um, your Larry and Jim doing? What are their roles? Um, my dad is really trying to hand off responsibilities at this time and, and transition himself into more a, of a retired position, although I think it's it's challenging for us to take all those responsibilities on and it's challenging for him to give them up. You know, I think when you love what you do, you don't necessarily want to stop doing it. Um, but uh, his position officially is chairman of the board um, and his day-to-day -day responsibilities are becoming fewer and fewer. Jim is responsible for the production agriculture part of our business. So he spends his days organizing the, the team of guys that take care of mowing and pruning and training the trees and and doing all of the harvesting 
So that's his kind of day-to-day -day responsibility. And I think he too is at the, on the verge of trying to hand off more and more responsibilities and phase himself into more of a retirement mode. And your title? I'm president of the company. Um, and Angie is uh, vice president of retail operations. And Jill, my sister, is vice president of food service, marketing, and HR. Okay. I think what we want to do here is take a very quick break and we'll come back and talk more about the, the rest of your employees. Okay.